one's tail. This is a very confidential subject and it's real hard to talk about. So I'm not sure how well this is going to come across. It might sound really, you know, mystical or something. It doesn't matter. I'm going to put it out there and whoever has ears, let them hear. So when one is on the level of pure consciousness, there seems to be a void because there's no things, no thingness, that state of being which is separated from other things. There's no boundaries, in other words, no divisions between this and that. And I'm not going to use the overused catchphrase, all one, because on that level, there is not even one. See? If you can have one, then you can have two, three, four, and so on. But on that level, there's no need to count because there, there isn't anything. So it's a void in that sense. But at the same time, it's a void that's full of consciousness, overabundant, unlimited, boundaryless, qualityless, self-engaged consciousness. And of course, this is wonderful. This is full of bliss. But in that state, you don't think of it as bliss. It's just normal, you know, it's just the way it is. Perfect happiness. It's when you come out of that state that you begin to see that the mind and senses are darkness, their ignorance, their suffering. They are illusion, a false promise, a false reality, because it's temporary. So when we look at the senses from that point of view, they all look like traps. They all look like darkness and suffering. So this is why the Buddha said, all perception is suffering. All consciousness, all activity, all sensation. He divided consciousness into six categories visual consciousness, oral consciousness, smell consciousness, taste consciousness, touch consciousness, and the mind, consciousness of thoughts. Because that's all the kinds of consciousness there are. We think in illusion that we're being conscious of objects out there. Uh -huh. But it's not so. Actually, we're only conscious of our senses. Of what our senses show us is out there. If you study anything in science, you know there's a lot more stuff out there that we can't perceive directly. Ultraviolet and infrared light, for example, or very high sounds above 20 kilohertz and so on. So there's so much in the world that we don't perceive or can't perceive just by the senses. So it, it just doesn't show up for us at all unless we extend our senses with some kind of instrumentation. Regardless, it's all illusory and it's all suffering. Why is it suffering? Because it introduces boundaries between self 
and not self. And this is painful. People think that certain objects in the material world are enjoyable. You know, like good food, sex, power, beauty, knowledge, wealth, uh, or renunciation and religious merit and stuff like that. They think that these are good things and they're wonderful and they're enjoyable, but actually, from the point of view of absolute consciousness, they are still forms of suffering because they divide the whole world into self and not self. And not self is ignorance. Huh? Like Buddha said, the whole world is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. Everything you experience through the senses, including the mind, has these three qualities, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not self. So, what to do? Well, I'll tell you what I do. When I'm feeling overwhelmed by the material world and alienated by its um, inherent isolation and loneliness, I go inside. I go into meditation. And I gradually drop all of these perceptions through the senses. This is the process called neti neti. Not this, not this. Huh? Everything that comes up as a perception through the senses or the mind is not this. It's not this, it's not this and that. And then finally, when there's nothing else left, all there is is consciousness. And at first, it looks like a void. It looks like there's nothing there. Well, there is no thing there because there's no object categorized by name and form. Or I should say, categorizable by name and form. There's only the original essence we can call it consciousness, we can call it God, we can call it Brahman, we can call it, you know, God or whatever we like. Doesn't change the reality of it, the experiential reality, the existential reality, that only in that state is there freedom from suffering. One time, a group of monks went to Sariputta, Buddha's first disciple, foremost disciple. And they asked him about Nibbana, Nirvana. They said, well, if there's nothing felt, how is it blissful? And Sariputta replied, well, that's the whole thing. There is nothing felt, so it's completely blissful. Because, as the Buddha pointed out, all perceptions, all feelings, all sensations, all sensory inputs are suffering. Because of the three attributes, they're impermanent, they're unsatisfactory, or imperfect, and they're not self. So what I do when I find myself mixed up in all this stuff, I go inside either sitting or increasingly these days lying down and just go inside and clear out all those perceptions until there's only consciousness, only Brahman, only the pure essence, non-dual awareness. And that's the state. Now, if I was more advanced, or if I was especially uh, blessed like Ramana Maharshi, maybe I could do that while my eyes are open. But I find that <laughs> very difficult. Maybe I'm going to have to work on that one of these days. But right now, it's such a relief, you know, just to disconnect from all the senses, 
and go inside into that void. You know, when people first encounter the void in meditation, they often feel scared, intimidated by it. But once you get used to having no things, no body, no mind, no senses, no possessions, no, no activities, no time, no space, <laughs> one sees it as a refuge. And this is why in the Devi Kalotra, Shiva recommends meditation on the void. You will soon find it's not exactly a void. I mean, it is a void in the sense that there's no things, but it's not a void because it's a fullness, a plenum of pure consciousness. Wow. I mean, there's just nothing better than that. So somebody might ask, you know, why, <laughs> why are you talking about the goddess and all these mantras and all this philosophy and all this stuff? Well, you have to go step by step. You cannot go from being in ordinary Jagra consciousness, where you are aware of all the objects in the world, and just jump from there into Nirvana, huh? Nirvana, Brahman realization, or whatever you want to call it. You can't just go in one step. I mean, unless you're very, very, how can I say, um, accomplished and used to that jump. But you have to go step by step from lower realities to higher and higher realities until you reach the ultimate. That's why we have, you know, the four vadas, four views, huh? associated with the four st stages of consciousness, Jagra, Svapna, Sushupti, and Turiya, at last. At Turiya just means the fourth. Number four, it doesn't have to, it doesn't describe the nature of consciousness in that stage because you can't, it's inexplicable. Uh, and, and you can't really, how can I say, you can't really map it to words, although you can kind of point to it, you know? Uh, like you can say it's associated with the sushumna, the middle nadi, in the spine. It's associated with the Sahasrara chakra, which isn't really a chakra because it has no divisions <laughs> or it has unlimited divisions, whatever you want. Same thing. And you can say, well, okay, there's no sensory perception, there's no mental perception, there's no activity, there's no personality, there's no uh, individuality. And, so on and so forth, no this, no that, no nothing. <laughs> but that doesn't really describe it either. It can't be described, but it can be experienced if you perform the process leading up to it. And that's what this whole channel is all about. And ultimately all religious and spiritual methods and teachings are all about to point you at the ultimate state and give you a step-by-step -step way of approaching that state. And so it's just a matter of taste which one of these teachings or methods you adopt. Whatever works for you, whatever seems logical and reasonable to you is the one you should accept. So I like this uh, goddess worship, Sri Vidya, and I find that the mantras, for example, Mahashodashi Mantra, are the perfect lead-in to the highest states of meditation. And she will help you. She will bring you to the feet of Shiva, huh? or Narayan, whichever you prefer. <laughs> Same thing, different name. 
and she will uh, give you the final little push <laughs> so that you find yourself in the highest bliss in the midst of the shining void. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum.